on inspiration for the long haul, getting there from here. All right, sorry, Max, you may have to move because I have to be able to see. I apologize. Yes. Um, I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe no, I don't know. I'll just try. We'll keep going. This one seems to have the, the best volume on it, the easiest one to work with. So, next slide, please. This morning, the title of the message is Just One Look. It's part of our Getting There From Here uh, series. These are loosely, loosely put together um, as one group. But if we're going to get to where we're going, which is life with Jesus Christ eternally, then we're going to have to walk that way here and do the things here that are required so that we can get there. For our students, um, none of you do really well on your tests unless you listen in class and do the studying that need, you need to do. It's not like you walk into class, the teacher says, hey, hey, there's a test, and you says, hey, this is stuff I've never heard of before, but I think I can do it. You study, you prepare, you get ready. Well, that's what we're doing as well. I was reading a few different books this week, um, so my brain is a little bit jumbled. If I happen to say the wrong person uh, wrote something, then please forgive me. But I was reading a book by Calvin Miller called Once Upon a Tree, and I bought this book about 14 years ago, and I've never opened it. Um, and I decided, I don't think I decided, because I've got a lot of books on my shelf that I haven't read. I felt compelled to get them, and I brought them back and haven't read them, and then suddenly I feel like, wow, that book that I've passed over bunches and bunches and bunches of times, I believe that's the Lord's leading. So I started reading, and it went right along with what I'd already been reading in the devotionals from the Ashes to Fire that we did several years ago. Well, we're back on that, the first one, and I'm actually going back through that book. I was reading one of the devotionals, and they work very well together. They, they work on the same subject at the same time. And I just felt that this is something that the Lord wanted me to do. Calvin Miller says that there are crucial questions of life. That every one of us has questions. And, and it doesn't really matter what culture we're in. It doesn't really matter um, what time period we live in, whether we're rich or poor, any of that kind of stuff. There are questions that every human being has. And he breaks it down into ten different ones. And I'm not going to use all ten today. But I'm going to use the first two. The first one is, why am I here? Why do I have life? Why do I exist? Was I just an accident? And I have to tell you, I think that the devil has been extremely crafty over the last several decades in helping us to realize that the only truth in the world is that we evolved from a lower creature. Now, you and I may say, no, that's not right. Ask our kids. Because it is what they're being taught. It is what the world around us is saying constantly. If you have another opinion than that, then obviously you just aren't very educated. What a clever lie of the enemy. Why am I here? If that's a crucial question for every person that ever existed, why am I here? Well, you're a complete accident. There's no reason. There's no purpose. There's no plan. You just happen to exist. Yay, whoopee. But if we were created by a heavenly father who had a design in mind and a plan in mind, then it changes our answer to the question. Why am I here? Well, before I belabor the, belabor the point too much, the second question is, what must I do to be saved? I know when I'm not walking with God that there is something missing. There is a missing part, whether I've heard about Jesus or not. There is a missing part in the soul of humankind. It's part of the reason that mankind has created so many religions down throughout the ages. We know there's something more. And so rather than, rather than live with that hole, we've tried to fill it. In our day and age, we have a tendency to want to fill it with things and popularity, with uh, all the things that the world offers to us today. And yet we find there's still an emptiness there. There's something missing. So, in whatever way we ask the question, what must I do to be saved? Or, how can I fix 
fill this hole inside me that I know is there? That becomes one of the, criti- the crucial questions of life. Unlike most often, I actually wrote down my sermon, which is really good because my computer was giving me all sorts of trouble today. So when I printed it out a couple of days ago, I wasn't sure, but I think this is why. If the question is, why am I here? Why do I exist? Calvin says it this way. Calvin Miller. If the despairing could only find meaning in life, death would never be their choice. He's specifically talking about those who say, well, I can't figure out why I'm here, so I'm just going to end it all. There's no real reason for me to be here. And he continues that thought. Life is only painful when we cannot think of why it was given to us. Life is only painful when we cannot think of why it was given to us. Now that does not negate the fact that we do go through times of pain, but for those who know why we're here, we know that that's just a path through which we travel to get to where God needs us to be, what He needs us to do, what He wants to show us through the pain, what He wants us to learn through that time. But life is is only painful to the point of despair if we don't know why it was given to us. He continues, Calvary is not just my giving tree where I give God all I am. God is the real giver there, and I the joyous taker. Now he's a poet, so you'll find the language a little poetic sometimes. There, I suck from the marrow of divinity the knowledge that I am here by appointment. In seeing the reason Christ came into the world, I know that I too am here for a reason. He asks this question, has the cross successfully answered its critics down throughout the ages? The cross is not real. Jesus is not. He didn't die for us, blah, blah, blah. And he continues, well, many generations of critics are now gone. And still the cross remains. It brings us new meaning. It sets our feet on a pathway that leads somewhere important. We want the cross to do this for the whole world at once. But that's not the way of the cross. The cross gains its converts one heart at a time. It enlists its army soldier by soldier. I fit in that category. There have been many times where I thought, God, why don't you just do what it's going to take for everybody to come to you, for everybody to know you, or for crowds, for thousands, for millions to come to know you. But the reality is, for you and for me, the best way to help someone else see why they're here is to personally be able to introduce them to Jesus. That's why your testimony is not one of the things that's debatable when we're talking about Christianity and those who wonder if Christianity holds any truth. The reality is, your testimony is real. Because it happened to you. It's who you were and who you have become because Jesus Christ has miraculously moved into your existence and changed you from inside. And you have a testimony for that. That's your testimony. And it's not something that others can um, just set aside or debate. Because it's yours. It happened in your life. So, if you're asking the question, what must I do to be saved? Or what do I do to fill this hole inside me? Calvin says this. We have only to stand next to the magnificence of Christ in our own shabbiness will be instantly obvious. When we compare ourselves to him, we recognize that I'm not really that bad a person, doesn't cut it anymore. Humility is never self-deprecation, he says. It is but gaining the true view of ourselves by standing next to his finished majesty. It's not about walking around through life saying, oh, woe is me, I'm a horrible worm, I'm a terrible person, there's nothing good about me, and just this horrible depression. And I've, I've met people like that. 
And they think that's humbleness. But that's not humbleness. Humbleness is recognizing that I was created by God for a purpose, but I haven't been living that purpose. I haven't been living that purpose as in my natural person. So when I stand against the actual measure of who I'm supposed to be, I realize how desperately in need I am. And I turn to him and he says, here, his free gift. At the cross, my sickly sociology is made well. At the cross, my egotistic psychology is exposed by his light. And it is there that I see the dying Savior and know that I must be crucified with Christ in order to live myself. He continues, To measure up is wonderful. We've been saved not by the Ten Commandments that we could never keep, but by the cross that keeps us and presents us faultless, without sin, and with great joy to our Savior. And there are scripture references that back up those things if you'd like them. Uh, I'd be glad to, to give them to you. Next slide, please. So, if we're trying to help people discover why they're here, why they exist, how to fill that huge hole in their heart that they know there's something missing, we need to look at a story, an account, that is pretty miraculous in numbers. But we start off in John because that's where, that's where Jesus himself makes note of it, makes a point of it. And then we'll back up um, and go to numbers. John chapter 3. John chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. Jesus says, now this is to Nicodemus who came to him at night and you know, he's wondering all, all these questions and he's already said to him, you know, you have to, in order to be saved, you have to be born again. And it's like, oh, really? Can you be born from your mother's womb again? Jesus continues, and as Moses, was, Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest or made known, that they are wrought or done in God. So, the very first verse of that, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Now, you and I recognize at this uh, point in history, we recognize what that means, that Jesus was going to be lifted up on the cross. But let's go back to the original story for just a moment, Numbers chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21, it begins... With verse 4, we're going to begin with verse 4. It's a whole series of stuff that was happening. Numbers 21, beginning at 4. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea. These are the Israelites, the children of, of God that he's brought out of Egypt. To compass the land of Edom, to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this, this light bread. They're real happy, aren't they? About what God has provided. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. 
Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he, may, that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that, that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld or looked at the serpent of brass, he lived. What an unusual story. What an unusual account. The people were complaining and griping and doing what people have a tendency to do when things aren't working out exactly the way they want them to look or work out. And so, let's be honest, God was angry with them. He had every right to be. He brought them out of Egypt by the strength of his hand, had nothing to do with them. He brought them across the Red Sea and conquered the Egyptian army with no help from them. He'd done it all, of himself, all himself. He'd taken them into places where there was no water and he bought, brought water out of rock. Now, not that, it's funny, the picture that we most often see of those kinds of events of, rock, of water from the rock, it's, it's a small, small little fountain, you know, like you would expect the water fountain, a little bit more than that, a little spring coming out of the side. There were over a million people, and they had all sorts of cattle and sheep and all sorts of things that still needed to be, needed to drink. So that's the amount of water we're talking about. We're not talking about a trickling stream. We're talking about large water sources. And God just opened them up. And then when they complained that they didn't have any food, he gave them manna and told them how to gather it and that they could use it. We, we read different accounts where they could, have, they could use it, they could roll it, they could make it into bread, they could make it into cakes. Um, this manna that God had provided them that wasn't their doing. They didn't gather from the crops that they had worked to plant. God gave this to them. They were complaining about that too. So they were complaining about God. They were complaining about Moses. They were complaining about the fact that obviously they'd been brought out here in the desert just to be killed because it was obvious that everything was falling apart. And so God gets angry, rightfully so, and sends these serpents, these snakes, and they begin to bite the people. Terrible story for me. Okay? I remember a scene in Indiana Jones. He hated, you know, in the very first one, he hated snakes. They dropped the torch down in that place and said, why is the floor moving? It's not the floor moving. It's all of the snakes that cover the floor. And he went down there, though I would never have, um, but I think of that picture when I think of these serpents. They're everywhere. And they're biting the people. And God tells Moses to do something weird. Now, it obviously couldn't have taken a lot of time because, because if you and I were suffering from a snake bite, we were in agony and afraid we were going to die, and it was venomous and we were on the way to death, Moses wouldn't take the time to build a mold and all sorts of things. We're watching a, a show on sci-fi. Uh, we enjoy it immensely. It's called Face Off, and it's about special effects makeup. And they're always making molds and things like that. And it takes them three days to make the mold that, you know, you can do some of the thing, prosthetics and things. This wasn't that kind of serpent. <laughs> this had to be crude. It's like melt the, melt the metal, melt the brass, and put it in... Maybe he drew in the wet ground, just a serpent, pour it in, let it begin to dry. This was something quick and fast, it was something very crude. Put it on top of a pole, and if the people will look at it, they will live. That's all they needed to do, was look. In Ashes to Fire, Russell Metcalf says this about it. There is life in a look. 
How simple is that? Jesus is going to be lifted up where everyone can see him, just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert. Those who look to him for life will receive life. Jesus was telling Nicodemus there is life for a look at the man lifted up from the earth. There is an answer to every cry to God that asks for help. Miller says, God is both the hound of heaven and the hound of Calvary who pursues each of us through, his, through our own particular corridor of time. One by one, he tracks us down until, seized by a loving God, we poor humans are made rich by a single look that enables us to live. Jesus speaks to Nicodemus about being born again through the Spirit. And says that even so, the Son of Man must be lifted up. So salvation comes for everyone who looks to Him for life. Metcalf says of the particular scripture in Numbers, The writhing mass of fierce, fiery snakes that began to attack the complaining Israelites sent them to crying for mercy. And mercy came in the promise that if they would look to the bronze serpent Moses raised on a pole, they would survive the snake bite and live. It was simply look and live. Faith and obedience had deteriorated among them into sinful complaining against God and God's man, Moses. Now, it wasn't simply about the object. I'm not going to read all of, all of the scripture there. But in 2 Kings chapter 18, we have the occasion where King Hezekiah had to break it because by that point in Israel's history, it had become an idol for the people, this brass serpent. Instead of looking to the one that it represented, they would say, if you need to be healed, just look at this. It's a, it's a healing talisman, basically. But it wasn't about the object. It was about God's instructions and being obedient to what God wanted them to do. So, next slide. One of the things that Russell Metcalf says, perhaps it began to dawn on Nicodemus that God's love might be greater, much greater than he had ever imagined. It might be harder to be damned than he had previously thought, or at least much simpler to be saved. Remember in verse 17 of chapter 3 of John, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. His intention is not to destroy. It is not to see how many people he can keep from coming. Instead, it is his Job. It is his desire, it is his plan and his purpose to bring as many to Amen. repentance as possible. Amen. I encourage you to read Psalm 107. <coughs> I'm just going to give you just an outline of it very quickly. It's a wonderful psalm. Read it. I read it in three different versions and um, it, was, it was beautiful. Metcalf looks at that and says, whether from ignorance or rebellion... Downright foolishness, or even merely pagan ungodliness, this song pictures how people apart from God and grace finally come to realize they are at a dead end. And as I read that statement, I went back to the psalm and I thought, yeah, this is broken up into groups of people. Some of them, some of them it's because of their ignorance of God. They have never, never known who he was, and there's ignorance there. Others, there's rebellion. We've walked away from him. We looked away from him on purpose. Uh, some, it's just foolishness. They're just running around doing what feels natural and all of that. And some have even been involved in pagan ungodliness. And yet, the whole psalm is about finding God. No matter what those circumstances or situations, about seeing that he is great and wonderful. Move with me to a new scripture that we haven't done yet. Ephesians chapter 2. Not that we haven't done it ever, but we've read this one many times, I'm sure. But Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians. 
Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. And you have equipped or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation or living in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened or made us alive together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And have raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained or prepared, that we should walk in them. Amen. Miller says, Jesus knew that it is the simple heart of a child that thrills in beholding the conquering work of God. Why do you think he called the children to himself and said, you have to come as a little child, this faith like a child. One word for salvation, according to Miller, is yasha. It's a Hebrew word. And the use of that word, that word means to create room, to make space as if by knocking down walls, barriers. So he says, to look is not just to live, but to thrive in a wall-less world. Here is the glory of the cross. It bludgeons ghettos, removes fences, and erases boundaries. It calls all littleness to stare at a world large enough to permit any wonder. The cross saves us by pushing back the walls of prejudice and small thinking. It saves us by pushing back the stockades of our narrow egos. It flattens our Jerichos until we stand blinking in the brightest sunlight imaginable. I've never thought of salvation that way. That it makes the impossible possible. You know, the town drunk becomes the town evangelist. That's not possible. But it is with God. And I knew the guy that was, whose testimony was that evidence. That's what God does. He breaks down all those walls. He breaks down all the limitations of, well, I'm just a human being. I can't be perfect. I can't do, I can't do, I can't. And he breaks that down and says, yes, you can. With me, you can do all things. Amen. Through Christ who gives you strength. Yes. Next slide, Ed. But there's a problem. Miller calls it the great determinant. To merely look is to live. Looking seems so small a price to pay for life. Still, it's the way God does things. He hangs a crude brass snake on a stick and commands us, look and live. It's a good deal. A simple way to end our complex lostness. We ought to instantly obey. Next slide. But pride is our great determinant. Our refusal to admit we are in need. Fang marked and envenomed with death, we glance everywhere except at the snake of brass, our only hope. Still, God is firm in the matter. Our living lies in our looking. Looking to Him. Calvin says, Calvin Miller, there is no way to God that does not depend on nails, thorns, ropes, and wood. Their love hangs, loving the haters, dying for the assassins, caring for the unconcerned, bleeding for the wounded. The blood of Christ 
is the witness of God to the triumph of love. This agreement is not completed when God offers us life through the cross. It is complete only when we accept it. It is a life for life agreement. We must be willing to give God all we have since God gave us all that he had. God will cut no deals with us for half a life. He will not bargain on proportionate dedication. With him it is either all or nothing. If we're not prepared, he says, to offer him everything, we must not waste our time offering him anything. Look and live. Can you imagine the scene with the snakes, the vipers all over the serpents and people trying to keep away from them, but they, they keep sneaking up and doing what snakes do that really creeps me out so bad. And people all around them are dying. And they're wondering why God is going to do this to them. I mean, they've been complaining and all, yeah, but surely God will save them. I mean, even they go to Moses and say, you know, do something. Pray to God and ask him to stop this. And they're being bitten by the snakes where they've been bitten and they're lying there in agony and knowing that they're going to die. And there's a pole, a staff, tall with some crude looking snake at the top. And Moses says, if you'll just look toward here, if you'll look at this, you will be saved. And yet, they want to look everywhere else. And it is the same with the cross. How can my life have meaning? How can I know why I'm here? How can I know how to fill this emptiness inside? And as human beings, we find it so easy to look everywhere else except to the cross. The one act, the one event, the one place that would change all of human history and would change the course of every life for every human being. Everyone. Jesus says to Nicodemus, just as the serpent was lifted up in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that all who look to him will be saved. Why is it so hard to look when it is the only real saving power? In the world in which we live, the argument is how can you know that your way is the only way? How can you be so arrogant as to believe that your way is the best way? I'm not. Because it's not my way. I didn't invent it. I didn't create it. I didn't fashion it. Not my way. It's God's way. Who's God? Wh whose God are we talking about? What God are you talking about? The God. The one who created all that is. I didn't create him. He created me. There wasn't a historical point in the world where, where the Jews or Abraham sat around and said, well, let's figure out who must be in charge of these powers and let's create this little idol and we'll worship that because we know there's something more than us. They didn't do that. That is what so many cultures have done down throughout the ages. But that's not what was taking place. That's why God said to Moses in the Ten Commandments, do not make any images and pray to those images. Because it is not about what you have fashioned with your hands. It is about the one who has fashioned the whole world by his thought, by his word. Amen. And this is the one who says, look and live. Amen. And too often, we're scared to look at the only salvation. Oh, maybe there's a self-help group. 
You know, I can, I can go to this, this group of people that's meeting and we can read this book and we can study this book and I can clean my mind of some of the things that have just kind of kept me trapped and all of this. It's not enough. It's just not enough. Well, how about if I try this religion where I can just, I can just try to own myself into oblivion and clear my mind of every thought and perhaps I can connect with the, the universe by just clearing my mind. God made us thinking people on purpose. Gave us brains to use them, not to simply check them at the door. Calls us to go out into this kind of world and speak truth and life. Just one look, Savior, and we'll realize, one, we ain't nearly as good as we think we are. Two, I am in desperate need. Three, he's the only one that can fix it. Yes. Fix Amen. me. Yes. Four, okay. he did this not because he had to, or as some obscure thing that he was hoping we would miss. He did this on purpose so that I could have life. Yes. And that's his desire. It is not his desire to zap me with a lightning bolt when I make the wrong choice. It is his desire to draw me to him. To make me more like him. He knows our humanity. And he's also proven... That in a relationship with the Father, we can be holy and sinless. That's right. Yeah. That's right. right. He took on our flesh and proved that it's possible, not by our own strength, but by total dependence on God. That's the message that we walk out into the world to give. It's just one look at the Savior. Well, how many, how many um, miles do I have to walk or how many times do I have to lash myself on my back or how many things do I have to burn in a fire? Or... It's not about those things. It's about coming to Jesus, looking to Him for our salvation. Look and live. We have a message from the Lord. Hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. It's in your hymnal. Should be in your brain. Look and live, my brother. Live. Look to Jesus now and live. This is what we have to take to the world. Not condemnation. We don't go out into the world to say, wow, you're a horrible, rotten person. We go out into the world to say, where you are, I have been. But where I am now, I am only by the grace of God. Amen. And this is the life that he wants to give to you. Not because you're worse than me. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all need a Savior. And there is the Savior readily available if we will look and live. Real life. The rest of our living begins to answer these critical questions. Why am I here? Yes. Because God planned you as a part of his plan, as a thread in his tapestry, as a block in his beautiful construction. Yes. He planned you. And he has a purpose for you. And if God planned you and he has a purpose for you, then there is no way that it is okay for you to say, I'm done. Because there's no reason for me to continue to live. We live at his use for his glory. And that is a higher purpose than any wealth or fame or anything else that we can live for. 
And how do I fill this hole in me? With the one who created it. The Almighty. Who came down and suffered on a cross for our sin. Who took all of the dirty filthiness that we have done on himself. And did not cover it. He paid the price for it. He didn't set it aside so it's in a closet somewhere. He forgives us. And he casts it as yes. far as the east is from the west. Amen. This is the message that we have. So getting there from here means that we live in this world with a message of hope. Amen. A message of glory to God the Almighty. A message of grace and mercy. It is a message that says it is not for all of your working and doing and striving that God will save you. It is for looking to Him alone. Amen. Amen. That's right. And He will save to the uttermost. Amen. Amen. Stand with me if you will, please.